I'm going to take you on a journey through some of the most magnificent scenery to be found anywhere on Earth, the landscape of the British Isles. We'll see great lakes and lochs, climb rocky peaks and mountains, and travel through gentle landscapes too, rolling hills and downland, corners of the country like a garden in flower. I'll sail round dramatic stretches of our coastline, where white cliffs rise like a fortress from the sea. Our love of this countryside seems natural to us. Yet it's only in the last 300 years that we've learned to appreciate the beauty of our own landscape. It took a group of pioneering artists to open our eyes to the splendor of our islands. It was here in the north of England that artists and writers first began to explore the wilder parts of Britain and to see beauty where before people had only seen savagery. So this is the landscape that changed our view of the world. This is the romantic north where the art of British landscape was born. the north of England, the scenery that inspired a revolution in the way we think and feel about British landscape. It's not difficult to see why. I'm following in the footsteps of some of our greatest writers and painters to the place where our love of the British landscape began. I'm heading for the Lake District. The Lake District is just a small corner of England, but it contains some of the most spectacular scenery in the country. Artists and poets have produced their greatest work here, celebrating the landscape. First time I came to the lakes, I was uh, 17. I came with my brother. We were making a holiday film. We're off on a holiday journey. We went all over the place. We went sort of walking around the hills. We went water skiing. We went to see the snuff factory at Kendal. We went on a steam train. We ate our high teas at half past six. It's a long time ago, and the extraordinary thing is it really hasn't changed very much. What has changed, and it's quite extraordinary, is the way we spoke. Jonathan, who's much lighter than me and perhaps a little bit more agile, went up like a cat, but my progress wasn't quite so fast. I mean, I can't believe it's the same person talking. Jonathan went up the rocks like a cat. 
and the hat. I mean, is that really me? <laughs> anyway, that was 50 years ago, and this is now. And what's magical is that this is the same landscape that they saw 300 years ago, and you can see it now in the 21st century. It's just beautiful. But the Lake District didn't always inspire people. Nearly 300 years ago, it was a place to avoid. When the author of Robinson Crusoe, Daniel Defoe, came here in the 1720s, he made it absolutely clear that this was the last place on earth he wanted to be. He said it was the wildest, most terrible and frightful of any of the places he'd passed. He said that the pleasant part of England was at an end. Defoe's opinion wasn't unusual for the time. The countryside was a hostile place. Bad roads meant accidents were common. Stagecoach travelers were prey to highwaymen. And if you didn't get robbed at gunpoint, there were bogs and marshes to drown you. Britain was still a land of superstition and folklore. The countryside was haunted by evil spirits, by goblins, by witches. But that vision was about to change with the dawn of a new era. The revolution was started by one man. He was a local clergyman called Dr. John Brown, and he saw things in a new light. He wrote a letter about it in 1752. He saw this wilderness as something wonderful, albeit something with an element of danger. The perfection of Keswick, he said, rests on three circumstances. Beauty, horror, and immensity. Nobody had talked about the countryside like this before, but travelers back from grand tours of the continent were excited by its dramatic scenery and by the painters who captured it. They began looking for the same excitement at home. It was the birth of the picturesque. Brown was rapturous. The lakes were immense amphitheaters surrounded by lofty mountains piercing the clouds. Waterfalls never just trickled, they tumbled in vast sheets from rock to rock in rude and terrible magnificence. Clouds were gloomy and great. And rocks and cliffs were of 